Thank you all so much. Um, I'm actually standing in for Dr. Rachel Moore, who was originally slated to give this talk, but I think uh, she had to get evacuated due to Ida and couldn't join us. So I'll do my best to fill her shoes and um, uh, share some of my ideas on these, on these primary endoluminal therapies. These are my disclosures and none are uh, pertinent to this talk today. Um, so over the next few minutes, we'll talk about why endoscopic procedures, why are these important, what our current options are in the future. And, and um, one of our prior speakers actually touched on several of these. And as you heard, a lot of them are being done outside the country and um, are slow to be adopted here. So obviously we know there are a lot of ways to lose weight. There's diet and exercise, there's surgery, there's medications, you know, but some of these don't work for everybody. A lot of patients have tried diet and exercise and they're not quite ready to make the jump to surgery. And so that's where these endoscopic procedures come in. I don't think I have to tell any of you the um, obesity pandemic that we're in right now in addition to the COVID pandemic. You can just see from 2016 to 19, how much of our country changed in color to over 30% obesity. So where do these endoscopic therapies fall in the spectrum of weight loss? And um, they're very attractive for many reasons. One, they're less invasive. Uh, two, they're not as expensive and as an actual operation. Uh, three, we like them to be repeatable. Um, often they're reversible. Um, that's a nice uh, quality for these to have, and we'll talk a little bit about that with some of these technologies. And the concept is that because there's no incisions, there's less morbidity in this high-risk population. And so our goal is to induce enough weight loss to decrease the comorbidities and improve the quality of life. And if you go to the ASMDS website, they actually say the goal of primary endoscopic bariatric uh, therapies is to induce weight loss and improvement in medical comorbidities with a safety and efficacy profile similar to operative uh, surgical therapy. So the ideal endoscopic procedure, in my mind, should have these following characteristics. We should be able to do it under conscious or deep sedation so the patients don't have to have general anesthesia. It should be a relatively short procedure time. It shouldn't be something that takes hours and hours to do because, of course, that increases morbidity. It should be safe, it should be easy to do, it should be reproducible. And one of the biggest aspects to me is it shouldn't inhibit future procedures. And I think that's really a, a big thing when we're looking at all the technologies um, being put out there is how they might affect future procedures. Because somebody, just like we're doing a lot of sleeve conversions to bypasses, might come in for an endoscopic therapy and then later decide that they want a surgical therapy. So, um, the other problem that we have with these therapies is what is our definition of success? I think everyone agrees on low risk and morbidity. We all talk, talk about them being technically reproducible, but really what's our outcome? And is it percent excess weight loss? Should we have the same expectation of surgery? Or should we say, well, if it's a more than diet and exercise, but less than surgery, it's still a successful operation. And some of the um, companies that have come and gone, I think some of their goals maybe were a little aspirational and, and that was what led to their failure. Um, so, so I think we really need to think about our definitions of success here, just like when we look at endoscopic anti-reflux procedures, for example. Um, durability, um, you know, that's the other thing that I personally kind of question. Does an endoscopic procedure have to be durable, like, or can it just be repeatable? You know, does it have to be something that lasts the rest of their life? Or is it something that gets them down, kind of like the gastric band was, right? The idea was you put the band in, they figure out how to eat, or like a balloon, and then you take the balloon out, and they know how to eat, and so they sustain the weight loss, you know? Um, but uh, being repeatable, I think, is one of the most important things, to have minimal anatomic alteration and be amenable to future intervention. So first, I'd like to touch on the space-occupying procedures. Um, and Dr. Revis talked about some of these. Um, the Orbera balloon um, is the one that's FDA approved here in the United States. It's a single balloon. Reshape and Obalon have kind of um, fallen by the wayside. Uh, and so this is the only one that uh, we're offering here in the US. And this is a, a very effective balloon, depending on what your definition of effectiveness and success is. It's done with an endoscopy. It requires an endoscopy for placement and for removal. I generally do these under MAC anesthesia for the placement, 
and then general because they have kind of a um, gastroparesis and a full stomach when you remove it. So a lot of times we'll do a general for the removal. Um, I fill up the balloon with about 600 cc's. I put some blue dye in it, so if they start to pee green, they know that the balloon popped, and then we can avoid some kind of migration um, so they don't get a bowel obstruction. That was one of the problems with the original um, balloons. And if you look at some of these trials, we can see out of 12 months, there's pretty reasonable uh, weight loss when compared to a diet and exercise group, 10% versus 3.3% um, total body weight loss. Okay, and... Um, uh, now, here's one of the concerns, right? This came out of the, with the FDA several, uh, about three years ago, I want to say, that all of a sudden people were like dying after these gastric balloons, and what was the big deal? Well, there's actually very strict criteria for putting in these balloons, you know? They're only FDA approved for 30 to 40. If people have had any prior gastric procedures, they shouldn't be placed. And um, uh, large hiatal hernias also, we shouldn't use them. And if you read a lot of the cases where these people um, uh, actually succumbed, uh, after having the balloon, you'll find that they were kind of pushing some of those limits. So so I think if we stay within the guidelines, um, for the most part, we're going to be okay. This was a nice pool study looking at 17 studies out there, 1,600 patients, um, showing uh, really nice um, sustained weight loss, greater than diet and exercise, at 12 months. And if we look at five years, 23% excess weight loss is maintained. Now, a lot of this information comes from outside the United States, and I think that, you know, we have to decide are American patients the same or different than international patients, are we gonna see the same thing? Um, but regardless, even though the weight loss wasn't the same as surgery, we still saw good improvements in diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. Really, these are some of the keys to success with this particular endoscopic therapy, regular follow-up, just like Weight Watchers works because people have to be accountable and come back and learn, make, get weighed and make sure that they're eating and drinking right. Same with the balloon. They need to come back for monthly visits, be counseled by a dietitian, make sure that they're following uh, the rules. Um, really helpful to have a multidisciplinary approach to this. We have an NP, a physician, and a dietitian involved with the follow-ups of these patients um, for the whole year, and, and really important that they do that ongoing follow-up for the six months after the balloon is removed. This consensus statement was done by... Um, Dr. Neto, our prior speaker, and he pulled 40,000 cases from around the world. As uh, Matt said, he teaches a lot of people to do this. He has a whole crew of people doing uh, these procedures down in Brazil, and he was able to compile this much data, and they talked about types of anesthesia, indications, contraindications, they, and um, uh, saw great success with this in line with what I showed before. Another um, endoscopic treatment, and this, um, some of the comments I made before replies to this, was the transoral gastroplasty. And this was essentially doing a VBG endoscopically, and it was basically a restricted procedure, and we were part of the multi-center trial. And they actually had variability in their dietary counseling, and they also set the bar to be as effective as surgery. And so they only saw a weight loss at 20% at six months, and basically, they just shut down the trial and the company closed. And I think if they had maybe a little bit more consistent counseling on the diet and um, uh, maybe not set the bar so high, maybe that technology would still be around. Um, the endo barrier was mentioned earlier, and this is a liner that lines the, uh, the lumen starting at the um, uh, duodenum and uh, goes down about 30 centimeters. And patients have, um, the original trial was done without any dietary counseling. Um, and it was really looked at as a primary treatment for diabetes with weight loss as a, as a nice side effect. It did get pulled off the shelf by the FDA due to liver abscesses. It is back in investigation. It's had some modifications. And the step one trial is actively um, recruiting at five different centers. Uh, and the data for this is actually very um, promising, and more so as the, as a diabetes treatment, less so as a weight loss treatment, but the weight loss is also uh, a nice aspect of it. Another technology that's kind of come and gone is the transpyloric shuttle, and this basically is like a little balloon that causes a, a gastric outlet obstruction and just kind of works as a ball valve. Um, uh, and they had some very small uh, studies looking at this and showed about 10% total body weight loss as compared to 2.8% in the control group. Now, mind you, this is total body weight loss with the balloon. We were talking about excess weight loss. So 
um, little different um, terminology, so just important to pay attention to those stats. The endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty, um, this is something we saw with a couple of the prior speakers. Um, this is probably one of the most popular and gaining momentum endoscopic procedures out there. And um, you use sutures to collapse the stomach to mimic a sleeve lumen. The suturing device is great to use, um, especially the current generation, if any of you have tried it. And there are a lot of different um, patterns of sutures that people have placed, the M pattern, triangular interrupted. Um, and uh, originally there was like the pose procedure where they just tried to collapse the fundus. And now that's evolved into, um, oh, well this is the essential trial for the pose procedure showing weight loss of 36 pounds at one year. And now we've gone to the ESG, which actually collapses down the whole lumen of the stomach to really look like a gastric sleeve in these different configurations, as you can see in the cartoon here. And um, I'm gonna go through some of this data in a, a little bit more detail. So this is what the lumen looks like. You can see the before where um, the stomach is its uh, native lumen is immediately after the procedure is performed in the middle. So it looks just kind of like a sleeve looks when we're done. And then three months later, you can see that um, uh, the reduction in the volume of the stomach is, is preserved uh, all the way to the right. And this is from uh, ASGE. Um, and if we look at um, one year follow-up, uh, they looked at three, six, and 12 month um, weight loss and they saw a nice BMI change out to 12 months um, of uh, a BMI change of seven percent excess weight loss of 54%. So you say, wow, 54% excess weight loss. That actually does mimic surgery. Now all of a sudden we do have an endoscopic procedure that does kind of mimic the weight loss that we see with surgery. And I think that's one of the really um, cool things about this technology. Um, and now there's more and more uh, studies coming out. This one shows that endoscopic sleeve gastropacity does alter the physiology and um, is successful in weight loss. And they kind of looked at the learning curve and showed that over time we could do this quicker because we really talked about how these procedures shouldn't take a long time and um, could do it in about an hour um, over uh, with about a 40 case, 35, 40 case learning curve, and that the BMI change um, and the gastric restriction were all um, in uh, a positive uh, light. They then took this a step further and looked, did a two year follow up showing 10% um, total body weight loss at 10 years that's sustained, or two years that's sustained. And so if we pull some of this data, we can say, okay, this is feasible. 57% excess weight loss is sustained at least out to two years. It's safe. It's got a 2% complication rate with um, uh, bleeds, perforations, uh, nausea, vomiting. Um, but is it durable? Well, do those sutures get loose? Does something happen to those? I think that's something that we're still learning about. But, but if you can place these sutures easily, then why couldn't you just place a new one if something does fall out? You know, that might be a nice thing, so that'd be the repeatable part. Um, to me, the biggest concern I have for this procedure is whether it will preclude pre, um, later operations, because when you put those tags in to tighten those sutures, you can't really staple across those, so you need to make sure you have enough of a lumen medial to that that you could place a stapler if you were gonna convert them to a sleeve or a bypass. So, um, so that's kind of my biggest um, concern with this particular technology. Although of the endoscopic technologies, it seems to be one of the most effective. Aspiration therapy, I encourage you to all read the Stephen Colbert or watch it on YouTube um, on this because uh, it's, it's a great take on this. And it, once you get over the ick factor, if you look at their data, the pathway trial actually at one year showed pretty good results. It's basically a peg and patients are taught mindful eating Carbs will not empty out of this well, whereas well-chewed protein and, and vegetables will. And so they showed excess weight loss 37%. And although all the other things are not, cannot be left in, this can be left in for a very long time. There's no BMI restriction for these patients. So it's a really, really, I, I think it's actually an interesting technology, but I have yet to find the right patient. But the four-year data is, uh, is good. Um, they've also shown um, physiologic benefits with A1C, diabetes, blood pressure. So I think this definitely has promise. I think it's just the key is finding the right patient who really wants to go and uh, have a tube hanging out of them all the time and also 
be willing to empty it after every meal. It's kind of like bulimia without the bad teeth, you know. But um, but the nice thing is, reasonable weight loss, removable, and does not alter future therapies. So on the horizon, I'm out of my time here. I'm going to go really quick because Manuel finished early. So I'll take a couple minutes here to talk about new technologies. <laughs> so, so the ellipse balloon, I think, is one of the coolest technologies that's coming out. This is currently in FDA trials. This will be repeatable. It doesn't require a procedure for insertion or removal. So an NP could theoretically, who wants to counsel patients on weight loss, could have a patient swallow it in the office, and then the valve dissolves, it passes in their stools, and they're ready for their wedding or to fit in their bar mitzvah dress or whatever might be coming up, you know, but, um, but it's, it's pretty amazing, you know, I think it could be really cool um, and, and very easily repeated with the appropriate um, technology. It doesn't require an, a procedure for insertion or removal, and because you can kind of do it over and over, maybe it has more durability, you know, and everybody's weight loss journey is different, so I think it's up to us to offer them everything that's out there. The Spatz balloon is another uh, balloon that's out there that has an adjustable valve, so you can actually adjust the volume of fluid that's in there. It's left in for six months. You can customize it to your patient. Um, this is also in um, trials more abroad. Duodenal mucosal resurfacing. Now this is a really cool technology, a company called Fractal. You ablate the tissue in the duodenum and it really, just like the endoluminal liner, really focuses on diabetes and shows a drop in hemoglobin A1C of at least 1.4% and very minimal stricture rate, very minimal um, uh, long-term implications. So I think that this is going to have some promise to it. And, and so we'll see where that goes. Um, it's gone from concept to actual human trials. And now um, this study has shown in 46 patients, 10 were lost to follow-up, but at six months, A1C reduced, HOMA reduced. And so for diabetes, this may be something for a true uh, a metabolic endoscopic procedure. Valentix is a little longer sleeve that starts at the esophagus, and, and it's kind of like the endoluminal barrier, so it's almost like doing a bypass. Um, so that, that's also in trials in Mexico and Canada. And then the magnemosis, we saw some of that earlier, that what if you could just use these magnets to make anastomoses and do a gastric bypass endoscopically, no incisions, and um, kind of marry the scopes from two ends and create these anastomoses. So really cool technology that's out there. Big barriers here in the United States is the cost of these procedures. Insurance companies are really not willing to um, pay for them. The definition of success, I think, is something that we have to decide as a society and also really take a multidisciplinary approach for these to be really successful um, with good dietary and behavioral support. And so these technologies are here to stay, but, um, you know, we want to make sure that they don't burn other bridges, and I think that's one of the things that we should really be mindful of as we um, implement some of these technologies and then also decide what's our threshold for the amount of weight loss. Thank you very much.